presentation, I will be exploring the cause of the current discord in Libya with insight into the role of the ruthless construction of a racist and nepotistic hegemony and subsequent brutal suppression and marginalising of the broader community has played in leading a region comprised of various cultural identities, identities which are historically broadly non-assimilative and aggressively autonomous, to a point of assembled unity in resistance to their collective subjugation and subordination. I will make suggestions as to how this event could be transposed into lessons invoking insightful response and reasoning from students in grades 11 and 12. Also methods that could be employed to relate events and reactions to the environments that they are explicitly involved in. But most importantly, I will suggest ways to provoke students to examine hypothetical avenues toward achieving harmonious, fair and sustainable outcomes. In January 2011, we saw conflict in Libya. The unrest, which continues today, arose from the impoverished citizens in response to having suffered under the iron fist of their ruling despot, Muammar Gaddafi. Gaddafi came into power in 1969 after staging a bloodless coup in the company of a group of fellow officers against Libya's first and only monarch, King Idris I. Idris was forced into exile and Gaddafi abolished the existing form of government, emerging quickly as the undisputed leader. This manoeuvre was backed by widespread support at the time from citizens and official recognition by foreign countries, and the officers were viewed as revolutionaries in their bid to emancipate the diasporic Islamic Arabs and consolidate an Islamic Arab state from under Western colonisation and declaring the country as a free and sovereign state called the Libyan Arab Republic. By 1976, however, Gaddafi's approval had taken a turn south. He enjoyed the unopposed leadership of Libya due to his propensity to meet any perceived dissidents with utter ruthlessness in deployment of his military. Gaddafi unleashed a reign of terror over his people that would continue for over a decade. Enemies of the revolution were fleshed out by means of extended jail terms, torture or even death. The abolition of private enterprise, state acquisition of public property, inception of a new currency and simultaneous demonetizing of the old currency, the forcible repatriation of Libyan exiles and gang-style executions of non-compliant expatriates on European soil were all measures which had a direct impact on the citizens of Libya. Gaddafi's export of terrorism abroad would result in severe economic sanctions which served to further impoverish his people. Only members of the banking institutions, oil industry and military were spared. Gaddafi's displays of crass tribal loyalty and nepotism in the distribution of Libya's wealth is a compounding factor in creating a huge disparity between a hegemony of disgusting opulence and some of the most impoverished, uneducated and suppressed citizens in the world. Although exact figures are difficult to obtain, estimates suggest that his allocation of national spending on the military is rivaled only by Israel, Saudi Arabia and other oil-rich Gulf Emirates. Invariably, commanding officers share a similar heritage as him and are overtly active in the promotion to power of his tribal kin. They are then the beneficiaries of the massive procurement process enforced by the military. More than four decades of exploitation by the Burgoyne class seems to have been the catalyst for the occupants of the marginalised proletariat class to cast aside long-held and historically insurpassable perceived differences. Furthermore, a collective identity has been constructed, or more accurately, discovered. One acknowledging the connection of poverty, brutal oppression and exploitation and pure marginality, thus providing a platform of unity transcendent of all prejudice in resistance to the tyrannical ruling class. All these factors would class the current civil unrest as a counter-revolution and has been met with foreign support with the provision of armaments and airstrikes. The rebel forces have achieved much in terms of territory gained against Gaddafi's militia, despite bearing vastly inferior weapons and being poorly trained by comparison to their opponents. However, recently progress has bogged down in a stalemate. There have been reports of members of the resistance targeting citizens, totally unaffiliated with any of Gaddafi's sanctioned cohorts, and subject to the same inequity as themselves, and even part of the very same movement until being ostracized based solely on sharing a heritage with Gaddafi's tribal allegiance. Also, elements have hijacked the protests motivating their own agendas against any black African person with accusations that they are Gaddafi's militia. This event is very complex, and I would suggest that a beneficial approach to learning from it would be to develop an expansive program incorporated into multiple senior high school subject classes and organised into a theme block across the entire grade, or perhaps even two grades, which would offer the students the opportunity to follow up their exploration 12 months after the first program, stimulating reflection and study of any predictions or analysis which may have eventuated from the previous year. I see this event as a valuable and viable focus for a multitude of classes, including drama, English, SOS, geography, history, economics and biology. Between both ancient history and modern history, students could research circumstances chronologically over various time frames leading up to the immediate affair. 
They can then analyze this and form predictions of outcomes based on what they've learned of past advancements or setbacks in that region and devise mechanisms of action that could be implemented by the people of Libya to conclude the conflict in a fair and sustainable way. They could also evaluate parallels this episode may share with other revolutions, notably the French Revolution, Cuba, World War II, and the imperialist invasion of Australia and its contemporary cultural revolution. Students could then be asked to compare results with those of engagements involving revolutionaries of the ilk of Martin Luther King or Gandhi. In both geography and biology, using different methods of approach appropriate to each subject, students could study the regions inhabited by the alleged diasporic Arabs and the other inhabitants of those regions. They could try to determine who the Arab race are and continue this with attempting to uncover what, if any, peculiarities qualitatively distinguish them from other cultures in that region. Even designing a Venn diagram of land intrinsic to Arabs, Christian Arabs, Islamic Arabs, Berbers, Jewish Berbers, Christian Berbers and Islamic Berbers then offer for discussion their opinions of the credibility of postulations made by one group or another that they are markedly different and therefore should remain aggressively autonomous and defy any assimilation. The complexities attached to the Libyan crisis regarding the contextual multiplicities within intertwining social constraints amongst various cultural identities would also be a valid aspect of focus for students in SOS, drama or English. Students could in groups engage in roundtable discussions or write or to devise a play dealing with the effects of being dominated due to difference and boom, be allocated a particular element of the uprising relating to dominance and difference to explore. For example, the capacity for a collective identity to empower the downtrodden or underprivileged. Also to show how the momentum gathered by such motivation can easily become wayward in its discretion and be cast off on a tangential trajectory which may serve only to marginalise an ulterior group, or how the group can become fractured, forming factions which pervert the original convictions of the group, resulting in a paradoxical degradation of the collective identity, as seen not only in Libya, but also closer to home, and can also be seen manifest as entire nations fixated upon the pre-conclusion of deficiency in difference rather than the potential enrichment of it. Let me be a little kinder, let me be a little blinder to the faults of those about me. Let me praise a little more. Let me be when I'm weary, just a little bit more cheery. Think 